Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Atlantic Bushcraft Adventures. Tonight we are on episode 23, I think. Every time I say an episode number, I generally get it wrong. So I'm going to guess at episode 23. I think that's what it is. It's 23 or 24. But in any case, tonight we're going to be chatting uh, about axes. Last week was uh, a quick video from the park. Ben and I had been out at Victoria Park? Sorry. Victoria, Victoria Park and Churro. Yeah. Uh, and we did a, a quick little episode from there. But the week previous to that, uh, we had gone back and started talking about some of the first gear we had talked about when we first started the whole podcast thing. And we're going back and we're kind of doing it in a little bit more depth, giving a little bit more opinion, focusing on one tool. Because we did do an episode that was on... So we just the tools we take in the woods and we touched on everything that we take really quickly and we said we were going to come back to stuff. So we're kind of starting that full circle thing. Uh, we talked a little bit about saws last time and we went into a little depth on that. And tonight we're going to talk about axes. And towards the end of it, we're going to just have a quick little blurb on the bushcraft gathering that's coming up this weekend as Ben and myself are going to be there. So stay tuned for that. But coming out of the gate, axes. Axes, uh, as you have heard Ben and I talk on our previous podcast, is one of those things, some people believe they're better than a saw, other people believe a saw is better than an axe, but we have what we have learned in our testing is that you can't really replace one with the other. Everything has a purpose, it has a function, and it does what it's supposed to do well. So, right off the hop, I'm not going to tell you that an axe is better than a saw or a saw is better than an axe. Can, would you agree on that, Ben? Yeah, you're, yes. Yes, I would agree with that. Okay, fair enough. So, yeah, everything has its purpose. Uh, so, tonight, we're just going to talk a little bit about the axes that we carry in the woods. I got mine here. I'm uh, sure Ben has some of his there, as well as some other options that are available to you, as and maybe a few things you may want to avoid while you're taking an axe into the woods. Um, so it's all personal preference. Once again, if it meets your needs and it works for you, awesome. We love to hear about it. Jump on, give us your two cents. Hey, Chris, how's it going? So this is episode 24, is it? All right. Awesome. So at least somebody's keeping track. <laughs> so, um, I guess Ben, what's, what, what do you look for in an ax? When you are looking for an ax to take into the woods with you, what do you look for ideally? Presently, I'm still looking for cheap. <laughs> and that's fair? I mean, I, I see people out there with, you know, $150, $200 axes, your Grand Force Brooks. Uh, there's there's a, a couple of uh, blacksmiths that, that make ones. Uh, they're selling right now that I, I think Hoffman was one that people are really liking. Um, I don't have a $200 axe. I have... The axes that I put together are picked up at yard sales and stuff. But I look for something that feels good in the hand, that's, that fits in my pack. This is my biggest camping axe. It's 24 inches long. I measured it before we started. It has a lighter-than-normal head for 24-inch uh, axe that came from a probably an 18-inch hatchet. So I re reheaded it. Uh, it was all fiberglass handle. Uh, and that's one of my go-tos. Um, but, but I look for something that's got a decent, um, I would almost call it, for your, your traditional axe. I got a few other things here, but uh, decent profile. Something with somewhat narrow cheeks, but not too narrow. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Can you see there? Yeah. Um, the, the wider, flatter ones are more for splitting wood, which I'm going to do a little bit of. The thinner ones are going to be better for cutting into wood. So you want something that's a bit of an all-around for camping. You're not going to take four types of axes with you, most likely. If you do, you're carrying more weight than I am comfortable doing. Uh, so, so that's a bit like yourself. Are you looking for similar things? Do you just... Well, I'm going to digress a little bit. I've learned what I don't like in an axe more than what I do like in an axe. So I don't like... A super heavy headed axe, as you said yourself, you want something that's kind of small, kind of narrow. And I, I'm not going to say I'm ashamed because I'm not. I learned a lot of stuff with this axe, but I used to haul a specific axe with me around when I went into the woods. And at the time, I thought it was the greatest thing ever. And I know somebody out there is going to see this and they're going to laugh and properly so. They're going to get a little chuckle. But I used to haul 
a double bitted axe with me. And the reason that I used to haul a double bitted axe with me, and as you can see, this one's starting to get a, a little worn and whatnot. I got to take it out and clean it back up. But anyway, the reason I used to haul a double bitted axe, and the reason I liked the double bitted axe, this one here is fairly narrow, as you had just talked about. It's thin. Uh, so I like that. But the main thing I liked was the double bit. I always kept one bit or one side dull. I just never really sharpened it much. I just tried to keep nicks and knacks and stuff like that out of it so it didn't deteriorate but if i was doing any work in it around the ground you just flip the axe over you'd use the dull side and i mean you never you always had a sharp side to work with but the downside oh, yeah. to the double bitted axe is that the head is really weird to swing uh where it is so narrow and so thin you don't have that back weight like normally when you flatten these off on the back you get a little back weight and if you're trying to throw it at something it has a little bit of sinking weight into it a double bitted axe doesn't have that it, it's got this weird glidey feeling, in my opinion, and it's a bugger to store in your backpack because now you have two sharp edges sure. versus the one. So you have to, like, the axe I carry, of course, I keep it wrapped. That way it can't, you know, get damaged or damage something in my pack or something like that. But with the double bitted axe, I always found that one side would fall off and I would always get some sort of damage or I'd be carrying it in my hand. And, uh, and for a long time, I carried the double bitted axe and the machete. And I thought I had everything covered and everything was great. But as I said, the big drawbacks of the double bitted axe is its awkward shape if you're trying to swing anything and the length of the handle. Like that's like a 36 inch handle on top of the bit. And I've learned I don't like an axe that long in the woods. That's just a little too much handle. Um, and the other thing is with most double bitted axe, you get this kind of straight type of handle versus one that's a little bit more ergonomic. And the other thing I didn't care for in an axe is you can go the other way and go too short. And this axe here is actually my wife's and it's great for her. It works well. It's great for women, but like, that's it. You know what I mean? It, it's, it's a wicked little axe. I, I can't even say anything bad about it. And it's got a tent uh, driver on the back of it. But for me, I, I can't wield this. There's not enough weight to it. I feel like I'm using some sort of weird inverted knife. So yes. yeah. I, I, I can't get used to it. She loves it because she doesn't have a whole lot of upper body strength in her arms like I do. And it works for everything she wants to do. She can use it to do some nice precision work because it's it's super easy to manipulate. But I, ju I just can't get onto it. I've tried taking it with me in the woods and I just, I can't use it. I look like a bumbling fool trying to swing this thing around. <laughs> well, you don't swing it. Happen? You, you know, Sorry? Does that have a bit of a, a, a notch in there for your finger to get in under the blade? Yeah, right there. Yes, yeah, that's pretty good. Oh, yeah, like I said, it's a great axe, just not for yeah. me. And that's the thing. There's yeah. always a tool for everybody. This doesn't happen to work so well with me. And there's a little better picture off it there. So it does have like a tent driver on the back or tent stake driver or hammer or whatever you want to call that. It's nice and sharp. Yeah. And you Is can, that a trailblazer? That is 100% a trailblazer for sure. So one of my other ones I had, again, my wife's, it's pink, pink, wife's, not, not mine. Sure, Ben, sure. It's the next up version of that. And I have taken this. I have used this. Uh, it does have a little bit of length, so you do get some swing, right? Well, that's the thing. There's uh, a certain length you need to get there before. But this one doesn't have that, that cutout, so you can get the nice tight grip underneath the blade. Uh, but it does have the ability, and that's what I, I would miss about your double bat bitted axe. I like the hammer action sometimes, to drive a tent peg in, or, uh, in fact, I often use an axe to make my tent peg. So, for something like that, to be able to then drive it into the ground would be pretty good. Like I said, if I practiced more with this axe, and Chris is kind of laughing at it on me there, but um, and this is Mel's. But if I practice with it, I think it would be a great, like, belt tool to kind of fill that gap somewhere between a knife and an axe if you're just doing I fine stuff. Great. Sorry? It'd be great for slicing that pepperoni. Well, I mean, if we had this when we had those pepperettes, just imagine what we could have done. But uh, you're right, Chris. This is excellent for carving and, like, just doing fine sliver work. It, it gives you a little bit more of an umph than a knife would, almost like a... Uh, all, kind of like a draw knife or a push knife, I should say. But uh, I don't know. I just, 
I've tried it a half a dozen times now, and I cannot get the hang of that thing. It's just too small. I always feel myself using it like a knife when it's not a knife, but I can't use it as an axe. So I don't... That's just one of the things I didn't care for. And once again, I'm not saying that's a bad axe in any way, shape, or form, because this thing is amazing, and Mel works wonders with it. I just... I can't use it personally. So that's... I've learned what I don't like in an axe. Now, what I do like in an axe is much like yourself. I like something that's cost-effective, uh, swings well, and packs up well, and it's not super heavy. So much like yourself, this is an old axe head I found buried at a farm, and I just reclaimed it, soaked it, cleaned it, and that's kind of why you got the uh, patina I think is what they call that. Um, and the handle is from a local guy down in... I th it's just outside Blue Acres in New Glasgow, but I can't remember the actual name of it. I, I can't remember. It's Caledonia Garden of Eden. But anyway, he works with ash. And I used to sell him wood when I did, when I worked on a wood lot uh, with Provincial Forestry and uh, Future Forestry. No, not Future Forestry. I worked as a subcontract. Anyway, different story. I used to work on a wood lot and we used to sell him ash. That's, that's all that's important. So I got in touch with him again and I went down and I got him to make me a few axe handles. So that's where this handle came from. That's where the one in this axe came from. My split axe outside. That's where the handle came from for that. Like he does good work. I myself, I can't make an axe handle save my life. Tried a half dozen times. It just doesn't work for me. I always get them twisted or crooked or they warp or something. So he does a good job. I buy my handles there and they're only like five bucks a piece. So a free axe head that I just had to put some elbow grease into and a $5 axe handle and i got the axe that i take with me everywhere now like i took this out when we went on our camping adventure yes uh and we ended up using your saw more than the axe which is one of the things we reported back on so what about you what do you not like in an axe ben uh i really like i don't like overly long axes. it's sort of like you said like 36 inches i can't pack up my pack it's difficult to carry in the woods I don't like one that weighs way too much. If it's big and heavy and awkward, I tend to not use it or, or avoid it. Um, but I don't know if it's so much what I like in an axe, but what I like about an axe. It's, it does a good job at doing rough work. Does that make sense? Yes. Sorry, I was just catching up on the comments there. I didn't mean to blindside you. Fiskers. Um, yeah, I have a fish cruise. Uh, and this is something that a lot of people are using. I see a lot of these on. They're really good because they're fairly light. They're virtually indestructible. I think they have a lifetime warranty. Not sure on that one. Uh, and I've seen people who absolutely hate this take them out and test it and can find no real fault in it. So, so what makes a Fisker's axe? Because, I mean, when you first sent me the term, I had to go look it up. Is that just the type of handle or is it a brand name of axe? Because I'm kind name. of an axe noob. I'm not going to lie. I, I just, I use them. I don't know much about them. I think Fishkers and Gerber are, are the same parent, owned by the same parent company. Fishkers makes um, different knives. I think they make some hatchets and stuff. Or not hatchets. Uh, well, they do make hatchets and machetes and stuff. Uh, they also make some garden tools like um, pruning shears and stuff. Okay. So but they... But you can get the same Fishkers brand, like these, up to splitting axes, to full-time boys' axes, to full, you know, the whole range. They're a hollow fiberglass-style handle wrapped around. Uh, the complaint of this is, oh, if you ever broke the handle, how would you replace the head? Well, the fact is you just bring it back to the store, they give you another one. Yeah, I was going to say, if it's a lifetime warranty, I think that answers your question. You don't. Somebody else does. You just get a new axe. And, and some guys even tried to do a video where they wanted some broken ones so they could show how you could repair one in the field. And I don't know if the guy ever managed to get his hands on a broken one. I've seen videos where people ran them over trucks, never damaged them. Uh, a so. Fisker's hammer at work. Cool, Merrick. I didn't even know they made hammers. Like I said, I'm I'm fairly new to the Fisker's name. I grew up with axes. I grew up splitting wood, but I, I once again, I don't know much about the brand names or the ideology behind them. I just know what I like looking for in an axe and what I don't like looking for in an axe. Well, so, you could go to Canadian Tire, pick one of these up any day of the week. You can go to Home Hardware, pick one of these up. They got a really nice hook on the end. They don't fall out. There's one that actually has a saw blade that fits inside back there. 
Oh, so those are completely hollow through, are they? Oh, yeah. A lot of people actually stuff like paracord and stuff inside of them just so they have that length there because it's a bit of a storage thing. I don't know how deep it goes, but it's like... That's quite a ways. Probably right down to the head or a couple inches from the head. So, you, yeah, you get... Here. Yeah, so right so down to right, the head. Yeah, and it's it's wrapped around. You'll never it'll never come loose. I mean, it's pretty st solid. It's small. This one's pretty small head. Like I can grip it up. I can do some fine work. I grab it in the back. It's not going to slip out of my hand. You can swing it. Uh, it's a solid tool. But the thing about all of these is, for every axe I have, I have something that I can store them in. This one here has this. Plasticky little thing that locks in. Got a handle on it. it straps to my pack easy. I got this Coonies that goes over my my wooden handled one. I just picked that up at Home Hardware. Uh, Trailblazer came with a sheath similar to the one on yours. Um, and that's that's important because I keep mine fairly sharp. I assume. Even when you talk, you double bed it. You keep yours fairly sharp when you take them in the wood. Well, one side I keep sharp, one side I keep blunt. Not dull, but blunt. Yeah. And as well as my lineman's axe, or that's what I've known it as. I, I don't actually know what you would call that. I've always called it a linesman's axe because when I worked with DNR, these were the axes we used to blaze lines. Yeah. So. It, it might be. There's the scout axe, too, or the, or, or the boy's axe. The boy's axe is, I think, a decent length. and probably sits between 24 and 28 inches. Um... Somebody's going to be able to correct me on that. And it's, and then I think under a certain length, they become hatchets. They're no longer axes. And then a, a full full size axe or is is like a 36 inch axe. It's a, it's a fairly length. And the great thing with that, as far as I understand, and there are people out there much more knowledgeable than me, is when you swing a full size axe, it will hit the ground before it comes back and hits you. Should yes. Right. If Where it's going it's right. Order axe. If I swing it down, I can bring it right into my foot. Or if I swing one of these shorter ones, I'll most likely get my knee. Mm. Uh, so you, you do need to be careful. I keep mine sharp. If I slip up, I can do a lot of damage really quick. But there's uh, things you can do while you're using the axe to alleviate some of those risks too. Uh, the way you split, things like that. That could be a whole other topic, honestly. It's just how, the proper technique of using an axe. Because uh, there is a technique to using an axe. It's, it's not just one of those things you grab, swing around your body, and throw it at something. I know it looks like that's straightforward, but there is a whole methodology to doing it. Like, uh, And maybe maybe I'm thinking too far into this, but I've always... For me, there's like a whole stance. Um, it's very methodical how I do it. Or not... Yeah, methodi methodical how I do it. Like, um, my hands, like when I, I swing an axe around... For those watching the video, when my hands come together here is usually when I'm at the full power stroke of the axe. And I like time everything so it takes the least amount of effort to get the maximum amount of torque and power out of an axe. So there is, in my eyes, a very, very learnable but very hard to master technique to using an axe for splitting and chopping. Would you not agree? Oh, yeah. Um yeah, I mean, there's a, there's methods to hold it. There's ways to, to position what you're cutting or position yourself in relation to what's cutting. Because if you're cutting a tree, you can't position the tree. You have to position yourself. But if you're splitting wood, the, one of the methods I like is a guy puts, like you get a log in front of you, put the wood on the other side and come down. So if you miss the, your wood you're aiming at, you're just going to hit the log. The other one I've seen is guys get on their knees. So when you swing, you hit the ground again before you hit yourself with a shorter axe. Now, the so only thing I'm going to say about getting on your knees to swing an axe for anybody listening is the reason people do that. Sorry, I shouldn't say the reason. My opinion on why people do that, it's to, um, in my eyes, it, it's to get, once again, one, minimize the damage to yourself, and two, get you to the correct height to swing ratio to get the full strength of the axe while you're splitting yes i mean that, that, that is obviously important you kind of want to hit the wood when your arms are say parallel to the ground should be approximately when you hit the wood if it's if you come down further if the axe is already now approaching directed at you yes so you would so if you think about it if you're cutting you would kind of want to hit it around shoulder height 
or just below. And obviously that's not going to happen if you're splitting wood. That's why when I split wood growing up, we always had a stump that was two, three feet high. Exactly. And we put it on top of the stump and then split it and then toss it to the side. So my happy zone for power stroke is about the bottom of my sternum. That's where yes. I find I get the most, because I'm a little shorter and broader. So, you know, when you're shaped like a ball, you do as a ball does. <laughs> but anyway, that that's my happy thing. And uh, yeah, growing up, we always used a splitting block or at, like you used a stump. We always just found the biggest block we had. That now became your splitting block. Everything got split on top of that. One, for protection. If it glanced, it had something else to hit. And two, it put everything at the proper height. Yeah. And we did the same thing. It was just the biggest piece of wood. We stuck it there. It was the stump or the, the block or whatever you want to call it. Uh, and we went through quite a few of those because we burnt a lot of wood growing up. Uh, that was always something that we were, it seemed like growing up, there was always a chore that wood needed to be moved somewhere, somehow. And I know I did less than the generations before me. They had wood even more constantly. So I can't imagine how the older generation did it. But Oh, man. I, my <laughs> little bit of a story time. My father, uh, this is how I got into the, like, working in woodlots and stuff. He always done firewood as a business. And we would do, on average, a four to 500 quart a summer. And uh, that all got done with the wood splitter. And for whatever reason, our own wood always got done, hopefully with the wood splitter, if it was still running at the time, which most times it wasn't, so it got done with an axe. So that's where I learned a lot of my splitting mechanics. And we had a house where you had to cup your hands to light your lighter because it was so drafty. So we <laughs> burnt about 12 to 13 cord of winter just in firewood. So I got lots of practice splitting. But like I said, I, I've always used an axe but I don't know a lot of the ins and outs of axes. I like, I know people will that really know a lot about axes can tell you specifics about the angle, of the handles and like just putting a head on a handle. There's a lot more to it than just jamming it on. You got to make sure it's not cantered. It's straight that you don't have a twist. Like there's a lot to it. And there's a people that are way better at it than I am, but I, I know there's a process to it. At least I acknowledge that. And that's what our listeners should be aware of too, is like, you have to appreciate the actual time, effort, energy, and knowledge that goes into the proper use, maintenance, and even purchasing of an axe. Yeah, and now I think you've hit, you've made a great segue into this, is maintenance is another thing that I want to have. And if, if we were going to compare the axe to the saw, the thing I like about the axe is it's easier to maintain in the field. Would you not agree? I would 100% agree. Like, um... I mean, worst case scenario, if you broke a handle, you could potentially make another handle in the field. If you broke yeah. the handle on your saw or the blade on your saw, you're going to be real hard prep. Well, you might break and make a new handle uh, for a bush saw, but if you break the blade, you're going to be real hard to, to, to make or forge a blade in the woods. As where an axe head, there's a lot of steel there. The chances are, I mean, I'm sure somebody somewhere has had an axe head completely fail on them and it's cracked or split or chunked or something, but generally generally that's not an issue no and that's so I, I grabbed a few quick things from my my drawer over there um where i keep bush crafting like items and i grabbed myself a file and i grabbed myself a sharpening stone now this isn't a proper axe one it's it's a knife one two sides of course and it's thin but the reality is i often use this for my axes Oh, and I always use field, my knife stones to polish my axes. Yeah, there's the round puck one that most people use because they're better than me. Yeah, uh, I lost but, mine, so. <laughs> but the reality is, if I had those simple tools, or even without those tools, if I could find a decently smooth rock in the woods, you know, like flat with enough roughness that I could do it, even if I put chips and, and dents in my blade, unlike my, my saw, if I cut into something with my saw and dull the blade, chances are it's now useless. Mm. The axe, I can put an edge back on. I can do minor repairs to it. I can potentially, like you said, replace the head. Um, another tool fits right in there with your file. Have you seen these before? They're called a four and one. Yep. They're uh, they're like diamond powder, aren't they? Uh, no. Uh, well, it's a it's it's not a file. It's a rasp. Oh, okay, sorry. I, to me, it looked like one of those four sided diamond sharpeners. Yeah. Oh, okay, so this, I see the it, rasp there now. Yeah, there's there's uh, curved rough, curved uh, 
fine. Flat rough, flat fine. And it's great for doing minor touch-ups and stuff. It's really good for fitting your head in your axe and stuff. Just getting those little, like you say, getting to making sure you got the right cant, making sure it fits in the head. This handle, I did a lot of work, and I'm still not truly really finished. And it's mainly because I got tired. <laughs> I got it lazy. It, the bulge here is bigger than I would like. I would like to, to mm. cut down more material on this. I cut down a lot. I used the four and one for it. Uh, I used a bit of a sander. I touched up the back, um, and I know like some people like thick handles because they get a lot to grip. Some people like nice and thin ones because they find it gives them more power and accuracy. Um, find what fits and is comfortable for you. Play with stuff, but fact is, it's generally, especially an old wooden handle axe, virtually bulletproof. Uh, you you damage it, you you can file it up, but. There's things to look out for. If you use this, the back of this as a hammer, which I think I do. I do too. I have to touch mine up from time to time. I was going to say, you'll find it starts to mushroom after time. You really want to take care of that. You want to take that out. That's what will eventually cause cracking and splitting, and that could eventually ruin the whole head. If you put a crack up and it goes into the eye, it's pretty well done. Um now, something Chris mentioned, since we're talking about maintenance and he was talking about the Fiskers, was that one of their disadvantages is the handle can become somewhat slippery. And just where we're talking wooden handles, because we're both carrying wooden handled axes, um, don't think these go without that either. In the winter, if these build frost, these can actually get incredibly slippery, and that's something to be aware of too. However, there is a secret to keeping your handle from getting frosted, and I don't know if you know this one or not, Ben. You see the little hole in the bottom of my axe? Uh -huh. So every fall, I put about eight drops of diesel fuel down there. Okay. And my handle does not frost. However, it carries the delightful aroma of diesel fuel for a few days. But it, it soaks into the wood. Like, I put the drops in, I store it indoors in my office, and I just keep it upside down and let that work down into the wood. And you know what? It's something my father and my grandfather have always told me. So if it's a lie to you guys, it was a lie to me. But I do it every year, and I swear by it. Like, I don't get frost build up on my, my woods axe. Uh, but when I, my splitting axe outside, when I had a wooden handle, it would frost up a couple times. It's actually caught me off guard and I've like actually slipped a little, never flown out of my hands. But what normally happens is you screw up the swing of your axe and that can lead to glancing or missing and inaccuracies, which leads to a lot of other dangers. But, uh, yeah, that's just something that I've done and it, it's always worked for me. So good, bad. Otherwise, if you want to try it, go for it. That hole does not go super far into the into the wood it might be in there like two inches it's just literally enough to cup the diesel fuel and let it run down into it a kerosene kerosene will work too because there's very little difference between kerosene and diesel fuel uh furnace oil same thing but um no sorry Actually, I, I feel that if you were to oil your handle at all with almost any type so linseed oil stuff like that we just keep the water out of it and that and could be exactly what it's doing it's just displacing the water yeah, um, I do put a little bit of like linseed oil or something on my axe. Uh, I, I'm just playing this, and this here has a rubbery plastic, and right now it's got a lot of grip. And that, that big swell on the back of my Fisker, is, is, it really hooks your hand. I would think you'd be hard-pressed to have that ever slip out. Could it move around on you? Maybe a bit, especially maybe with gloves, maybe. But I, I think it's got a decent grip. I would put it as comparable. Uh, there's probably a situation where they're bad. The other complaint I've heard with the Fisker is the metal is a little bit soft and well nicked relatively easy. A little bit of upkeep. That's all that is. Uh, yeah. Um, so it's something to keep in mind. I mean, they're not they're not truly bulletproof. You hit a rock or a, an overly hard piece of wood, you can put a nick, a, a dent, a damage to... Uh, to your axe but they're usually fairly durable and something you can really pound with i mean so here's a bushcraft hack for you straight from chris the man himself a good thing about the fiskers though you can have a heated handle just shove a couple hand warmers down in them once they're activated thoughts 
that is genius. <laughs> That's what I, I was not, just thinking. I was wondering, I wonder if that, he may be saying it as a joke, but I'm taking it seriously. And I'm like, I wonder if they would actually I'm fit not, down there. I, I'm thinking that that would work. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. And it would pop, because it would restrict the air and you'd only be getting it in the end. I think it would last like all day. Like you put one in there, I bet you it would last the whole day. So it'd be great for doing small workout around the camp in like say fall or winter. Well, this is the thing, like... I mean, it is genius, Chris. I, I, I got to commend you on this one. But uh, when you're working with an axe, oftentimes, like working with gloves, it's it's awkward. Uh, I mean, we pushed gloves in the past, and, and these thin gloves here would probably be fine. But heavier gloves, you just don't have the uh, the feel to, to truly do what you want to do, uh, especially if you're doing the finer work with an axe that you, you could potentially do. Now, these have great grip, too. So that, But yeah. You could really allow you to do work longer in a situation where it's cold out and you need to work with it. You love uh, so that that has uh, some potential. I like it. Um, so apparently, it does work. He has done it. He just well, climbing it back. So what, I'm I'm gonna. It seems ingenious. That is an absolute ingenious idea. So there's the takeaway, if nothing else, from this entire lecture or not lecture, podcast, sorry, if you have a Fisker's bush axe or hatchet or anything with a hollow handle, heated handle. You heard it first here at Atlantic Bushcraft Adventures, straight from the man himself, Chris. Now, have you seen some of the, and I'm going to call them gimmicky, but honestly, they're not horrible, in theory. I think Zippo released an axe, Zippo of all companies, that had a... Uh, Buck saw blade inside the handle and it reached over and it hooked onto the uh, the sheath for the axe and you held onto the handle of the axe and you could cut. It had like the triangular shape. I have not seen those, but I am intrigued. And Fiskers or Gerber, I'm not sure which, like it had the one where I said like it's kind of a sort of like this style, like a handle with a, a just a blade mm. and it slides right into the hand into the handle of the axe. So you have like a two in one option. So there's there's some neat things out there. I seen a guy put like a whole little survival kit in one of these. He had like a fishing kit, a ferro rod, a lighter, uh line and all that, and he plugs it all up with just a, a wad of uh of paracord. And then like you said, if he needs anything, you just pull the cord and everything came out with it. Well, I mean, if, if it's a hollow space in the handle, why not use that for something? Reclaim the, the space? I mean, that's an ingenious idea, too. I mean, they have entire YouTube channels and forms, uh, web forms on uh, uh, Mora knives and how to deck them out to be more survival. I'm sure if you do a little digging around, they probably have a hundred different modifications for these little Fisker axes and stuff. Well, these are videos. Like, I've seen these on YouTube. You Google... Fish your axe and survival, I'm sure, if someone's going to have all kinds of stuff. And like I said, this is the small one. This is the X7, but I think there's an X10 or an X9. Like, there's bigger ones. There's ones that have, that are, you know, for splitting wood. There's ones, you know. So there's a, they have a whole series of it. And you can find one that works for you. You can find a decent wooden axe. You can go down to a local flea market, look for an axe with a handle on it or without, and handle it. Like you say, go to your, uh, I've been down to the farmer co-ops where I buy my handles. There's a guy from Cape Breton, I think, sells them theirs. And uh, I bought an axe from there. Uh, it has the uh, Hudson Bay style head, you know, if you know what I mean. It's kind of got like um, it's, it's got the drop at the front. Yeah, it comes out and drops at a, at a fairly significant angle, but it's very angular. It's not like a a Viking axe where it's nice and smooth curve or anything, right? And relatively cheap to buy. Uh, could cut butter with it, honestly. Um, but I sat down with a file at the cabin and I put an edge on it and it's been holding up relatively good. It's after another year or two at the cabin, it may actually get upgraded to something I'd take camping, but I wanted to buy the one this size. They didn't have it when I showed up. They had the shorter hatchet. So that's what I bought to play with. Um, and it's doing okay at the cabin. It's, it's not sold itself as the, the ultimate max, but it's doing good. So I'm gonna I'm gonna play with that some more. But no, I'm I like the axe because of what it does. It allows you to do some pretty heavy work relatively quickly. Um, 
I wouldn't say I, I would carve a lot with an axe. I don't have that skill. This but one I, I might rough, try it. Because yeah. it is small I would enough. Rough I, would... Some, I would rough something out with an axe and then finish it with a knife. Um, and I've definitely made like tent pegs and posts and stuff. Like if you want to sharpen the end of a post and drive it in the woods, you try that with a buckshot. Try yeah. all day. You can do it. It's a lot of work. Somebody with an axe could do probably 10 in the time you're going to get one or two done. Because it's the tool for the job, right? You want to cut down a bunch of trees? The saw might be your better option. You want to save wood? The saw might be a better option. Mm. You can have a lot of chips. And... Well, that's just it. You do get some waste with an axe, but I usually end up using mine as kindling anyway to get the fire going the next morning, as long as it's dry. I mean, if it's wet, oh, yeah. maybe not, but... Um... So, we did touch a little bit on the maintenance. I want to go a little bit more over that. We talked about the handles. You uh, put linseed oil on yours, but you should preserve your handle in some way, shape, or form. I'm bad for not doing it, um, but I do find the kerosene that I put down the handle, uh, it does kind of preserve the wood as well. So, that's why I never really finished mine. I was worried if I put some sort of coating on the outside, it might react with that and cause things to go bad. I mean, this one here has been... Ooh, how old is this now? When was that? 2016. So this is probably same handle and head for this since 2013, maybe 2012. Yeah. And uh, I, I actually bought a spare handle for it, and it's still sitting out in my mudroom. I've just never needed it. Um, but the other thing I wanted to mention for maintaining your axe is you should keep it sharp, somewhat sharp. Now, here's the age-old question. Do you make it razor sharp or kind of sharp? And I guess that's kind of what you want to do with it and what your skill level is. Uh, some of my axes I keep razor sharp. Some of my axes I don't keep as sharp. Uh, the sharper you make an axe, the more, and this is only my own opinion, I find the sharper an axe is, the more I'm touching it up. I didn't see what you did there, Ben. I was kind of, did you just shave well, the hair off your arm? <laughs> really. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, keeping an axe sharp, the benefit of it is you can do a lot of fine work uh, and you know what you're getting into. As Ben's showing there with his, for nobody watching, he can actually shave the ar the hair. to shame the arm off his hair. Shave the hair off his arm. <laughs> oh, I can do that too, buddy. <laughs> uh, and I mean, that that's a great way to keep, in my opinion, a smaller axe. Now, the bigger the axe gets, once again, my opinion. Everybody's entitled to it. Um, as my axe gets bigger... It's not necessarily duller, but I don't have that narrow, uh, that narrow angle on it. What, what's the word I'm looking for here, Ben? I, I space it out and make it a little bit more blunt. Yeah. So, yeah, so that, by, by putting a more cute yeah, so angle on it, you're, you're creating more of a, a chipping motion. So if you want to knock big chips off, you kind of want that that angle. If you want to split wood, you kind of want that angle. I mean, my old splitting axe, I think had a 45 degree angle on it. Like it was, it could have been closer to 90. Like it was pretty, pretty steep, but it also weighed 12 and a half pounds. And that's, I Not guess what I was trying to get at, I guess the bigger the axe, the more I use it for splitting and like actually, you know, hammering on stuff. So as Chris said there, the sharper it is, the easier it chips. That's why as it gets bigger and you have all that weight and power behind it, you do kind of want to bring, I don't know if you want to make it duller, but you definitely want to bring that that cutting angle out a little bit. Instead of having like a knife edge on it, you want to get more of a wedge action on it so it doesn't chip as easy. And two, especially if you're using it to split, it forces the wood out around it. Like my brand new splitting axe I just bought this spring. Um, you know how you always see people, they'll take an axe and they'll drive it in a stump and it sticks? My splitting axe will probably bounce straight back out. Like it doesn't oh, yeah, stick well. into anything. Now, a lot of people say your your inch your tip should actually be like like an apple seed. So it starts off relatively steep and then rolls into a, a, a gradual point. So it's actually like if you think about it, at like three angles, I guess. Your your your, mm. your initial base, and then come in a little bit, and then come in a bit more, and then finally the third one. And then you when you're touching it up with the stone, you almost round that off. That rounding is going to give you a more durable head. So basically, that tip's not going to pivot to one side or the other. It's going to have a lot of support on the sides. That's going to allow you to swing at that against harder objects without damaging the blade. 
uh, this is great when you're splitting, cutting into harder knots, doing that type of work. I tend to do cut a bit more green wood with my axe than maybe I should. Uh, so I like a really sharp axe. And I've realized the limitations of my sharp axe and the advantages of it. Um, that being said, my Fisker one isn't quite as sharp. And I think my Trailblazer one, and yours is probably the same thing, it's really much more like a knife. Uh, at the piece on this thing. Yeah, or it's... The, the profile. It's got a weird it's, profile on it. Like, I... Just it's just showing, straight up. Like, it's, it's a sheet, a piece of sheet steel, really. And then file, file down. It's very right. similar, probably, in thickness to a, a thicker, more uh, knife. You know? There we go. That's almost the profile and, and, and angle of it. It's very much like a knife. I'm sure you could shave with it, and you keep it sharp. You're not going to split wood with this thing. Well, not any volume of wood. No. Like you might split... It'll dull fast. A one you can split a one-inch round piece if you want to do some tight work. If you need to make a tool or something, yes, you could do that. Are you going to split a four-inch piece of log with this? No. You're going to drive it in. It's going to sink in nice and smooth. It'll probably go right up to the to the plastic and not split that piece of wood. And that's just because of that narrow angle. And uh, Chris, just shouting out to him again, made a real good analogy for anybody because axes aren't as common, but everybody normally knows knives. And he said, uh, same as knives. Fillet knives, very fine angle on it, made for very fine work, very sharp, versus a meat cleaver. Meant more for power and chopping and hacking, if you will. And the same applies to an axe. Yeah, in fact, I would say that that little hatchet, you, or that little axe you got there that melts, is much more akin to a cleaver than an axe. Yeah, and you know what? That's a perfect way to describe that. It's like a short-headed cleaver. <laughs> but it still works good. Like I said, I am not knocking that hatchet in any way, shape, or form. It serves a very specific purpose, and she loves it. And I'm not taking anything away from it. But, um, but that's the thing. You, you gain, the power of an axe is gained through the swing. Uh, you can pull back and you can swing. You can drive it into a piece of wood. You can use the back as a hammer. It's a multi-use tool. It has... It definitely has a, a purpose and, a, and a, a spot in my pack for a lot of trips. Um, I'm now to a point where I camp with, if I camp with others, I'll often talk about what are we taking and say, we don't need two, three axes. We don't need two, three saws. We don't need some, some of this equipment. Compare it to a knife, I'm never going to call up Robert and say, Robert, let's go camping. Are you taking a knife? I'm not going to bother. Yeah, I generally have like have, two or three knives on me at all times. I'm going to have, yeah, also, I am at least going to have one knife. I don't know if I've ever, except when they put me on a plane and I have to be without my knife for a few hours, I'm never without a knife. That's pretty much where I'm at, too. Even when I'm working, though it's not much of a knife, I still got something like that, which is just a box cutter, don't get me wrong, but still, that does a lot of good stuff. And in my environment, yeah. which you know what it is, that's still... <laughs> An interesting thing to have on my hip, but they allow it, so. I keep, I keep like, a little Swiss Army knife at minimum. I, I have a ton of belt knives and stuff. If, if I'm in a place where I feel that it's somewhat appropriate, I don't tend to go downtown, Halifax, in the mall, almost ever. But if I did, I wouldn't have a belt knife on me. Just because you get looks, you get complaints. Know your crowd. Any... Huh? Know your crowd. Yeah, I don't think there's any law against it. Someone may turn around and say, no, Ben, you can't walk downtown Halifax with it. As they long as it's out. not yep. concealed, you're allowed. That's the thing. If yep. it's concealed, anything over eight inches concealed is against the law. If it's over eight inches and it's not concealed, as long as it's not considered a sword or a weapon of destruction, then you're fine. So that's why they don't allow, uh, in the States, you can buy like what's called a belt knife or a cane knife. <laughs> Those are illegal yeah. in Canada because they only serve one purpose, and that's to hurt other people. But, yeah, as long as it's a functioning knife over eight inches, as long as it's not concealed, you're you're good. I, for one, think we should bring back the sword. You know what? It's legal to duel people in Canada. Did you see that? Kind of I drifting did. off topic here a little bit, but you are legally allowed to duel somebody with a sword in Canada, which I think is just absolutely awesome. If anybody wants to look that up, just Google it. I, I, you know, it, it's there. 
It's there. I you were going to say, if anyone wants to duel, I'm here for you. <laughs> Bring it on. No, no, no. If you want to look it up, go look at it. I'm not going to duel anybody because I know I'll just get myself killed. But... I'll tell you what, but you get yourself in a duel, I will make you the sword. <laughs> nice. But anyway, we digressed a little bit. Um, last thing I'd like to say maintenance-wise on this. Do you oil or wax the, uh, the head of the axe at all? I am a horrible human being, and I do not really. Uh, if I notice corrosion or something building up on them, I might spray a little bit of oil or even maybe, if I had to, WD-40, uh, clean it off. Um, but over than that, I don't generally keep them oily. I do keep them dry and clean. Uh, I think a bit of wax would be a good idea. Yeah, I'm looking at mine. I don't have any actual rust. Mine's all patina. I know it doesn't look like it, but there is no actual rust on that. But I do use a light coating of oil, uh, and I have done a little bit of wax and tried it. Uh, the reality is I just I don't invest the time into putting wax on. Oil is easy when I'm sharpening it, if I'm using honing oil or something. Once I wipe it all down, I might put two or three drops on the head and just kind of give it a, a go over. I know it's not the, the best oil for it, but, I mean, oil is going to displace water, and that's all it's meant to do is prevent rust. So... Uh, I also subscribe to the theory that you should not paint your handle. No, not paint your handle. Why? For the slipping aspect of it? If you go into any hardware store and find like a, a store-bought axe, I would say like the, was it Garant, G-A-R-R-E-T? Yep. Uh, those, they're all like the handles are dipped in like a paint sometimes even with, like, a grit in them and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I have been told, and I believe it to be true, although I haven't really tested it, that a painted handle will chafe your hands quicker, cause blisters and general discomfort. And the companies sell them like that because it's cheaper and easier than oiling them and maintaining it while it's in the store. Paint's kind of a one-off thing. Uh, a lot of guys out there on YouTube and, and, and the Internet world will tell you, that if you get a get one with paint, get like a, a scraper, a scraping card, or one of these foreign ones, and sand it all off, oil it, and you'll have a better axe. I believe that to be true. I just can't prove it one way or the other. Okay. Others will try. I got one for you. So the guy I buy my axe handles off, I asked for it not to be done because I like the consistent wood grain. He does not paint them. He no. salt water dip dyes the end of his handles. What do you think of that? That's I, I see no issue with that. So I, I thought it was an interesting process. I just didn't want, because it doesn't look like the bright blue or red or whatever you get from a store. It's just kind of an off color. I didn't care for it. But I mean, uh, he does them in orange because a lot of his handles, they go out to like people that work in the woods. So they want something that's easy to see. Um just reading up on Chris's thing here. He, for one, thinks that we should be allowed to own switchblades. Well, switchblades are a whole other thing. Um, long story short on that, technically any knife you can open with one action is illegal in Canada. Um, so, but there's a super weird gray area in there because technically this knife here, you can go to Canadian Tire and buy because you can open that with one hand, right? But I would not be able to ship that into Canada. So there is like a weird double standard for knives coming in. I've actually had knives canceled at the border and sent back because they could be opened with one hand exactly like that knife. Now this, this whole conglomerate, my multi-tool here, technically you can open any of that with one hand. That's why it's an OHT, one-handed tool. You can't ship them into Canada anymore. So, I mean, there's a very weird law in a place there, and I suggest anybody that's interested in it or buying knives outside of Canada, do your research, or you're going to be horribly disappointed because I'm out like 200 bucks in knives. But, uh, yeah, there's some weird laws there. Switchblades. Like, I, I... A knife's a knife. I don't care how it opens. I'm a firm believer in tools, or tools, and it's people's intentions that are bad. Take... For that, what you want, that's... I don't have a problem with switchblades. They're banned because they're a weapon. But, I mean, it's still just a tool in my eyes. I mean, you can get the switchblades that are literally just a weapon. I get that. But, I mean, for the basics of argument, I kind of agree with you, Chris. Uh, as long as you're using it as a tool, you're good to go. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I kind of agree with you guys there. I kind of see the point on some of them. 
But I have I have knives here, and knives I buy at Canadian Tire Net. They have the little stud on it. You can grab it with your thumb and click it open, and I play with those all the time. When I got the Gerber originally from the military, you know, open up the the pliers and whatever, that, you know, that action's fun. I've had knives where you can adjust the tension for how the blade is held, and it still had a locking mechanism, so I just backed the screw off by a quarter to eighth of a turn, and then just through centrifugal gravity, when you swing your hand out, it would fly open. I see no real problem with those, personally. But if you have a knife that's pretty well only purpose is going to be to shiv someone, I don't see the point of having it. I really don't. Uh, and that would be something that's too thin and to, to really carve in wood. You really wouldn't fill it. It would no longer be it. a tool. Yeah. Um, I don't think there's a ton of those out there, though. I think... You know, a knife is a pretty multi-use tool. You, if you can cut with it, you can at least open a letter with it. If there's a re another reason to have it, I see no problem. Now, uh, seeing we're down this rabbit hole already, the one that really gets me is butterfly knives. Ooh, yes. I like butterfly yeah. knives. I think they're fun as heck. I don't know why they're illegal, because they're generally single-sided. It's just generally, and I say this loosely, it's still just a single-sided blade with a weird mechanism to open. But anyway, that's a rant for another day, but... Um, there's, there's another net balsa knife or no? uh belly song so you can buy on sharpened ones yes as long as they're drilled in ceramic yeah if you have no possible way of putting an edge on it i can put an edge on anything buddy. <laughs> if you take the blank out and you reshape it and put a new one in it i mean there's holes through this whole thing but anyway yeah uh you can buy they're called practice belly songs and they're for just learning like the knife tricks and things like that but um yeah there that's once again a whole other topic and we can go down that rabbit hole later um slowly jumping back to axes i guess is there anything you want to say on the axe topic oh yes there is one thing i wanted to include on this axe topic and get your opinion on it i don't have one so i can't say much but it's kind of an axe not really an axe or you you know the ones I, i'm talking about they kind of look like a machete with a hook on the end of it but they, they consider them an axe? The bush axe. I think it's one of the names on it. Okay. Or, or a bill hook. Yeah, like, like a bill name. hook axe or something like that. I don't own one. I have zero experience on it, but we're talking about axes. What's your thoughts? So I also do not own one, but I have had the advantage of using one. A buddy of mine brought one to my cabin. Uh, I camped with him occasionally. I camped with him only a few weeks ago with at uh, Gaspar Lake. Um but he had one. He came into my cabin with it. He, he We used it because I knocked out a fairly large tree. I actually knocked it into the lake, maybe. Okay. Maybe it fell near the lake. Let's just say that. Um, and to cut it and clean it back out of the lake, we used that tool. And it is awesome. It kind of has that ability to reach out and hook something and cut into it. The shape is quite neat because it, it gives you that swinging action, but it also kind of gives you like a knife action. And that hook allows you to kind of get a, a pull and cut action out of it. Uh, it has its uses. Uh, I think he actually prefers it now to an axe in the woods. And that's the thing. And Some people really do. I've never used one, so I don't I don't know. It has its, it has its purpose, and, and it's kind of one of these doesn't really fit in, in, a, in a specific category, but honestly, it's, its blade is just as functional as this, you know, like the thin... Uh, trailblazer style that we had here. Uh, you got some decent reach with it, probably as much or more than this because of it's just its whole action. So are they um, any good for splitting? Could... Or does that hook kind of defeat would... that purpose? I, th I think you could split smaller wood with it if you're careful, but it wouldn't be an ideal tasking for it. And okay. I think you would be hard pushed to use it to kind of cut like a, a to sharpen a, a stake or a, a post, because again that hook kind of is in the way. But to delimit a tree or to cut down smaller bush, yes, like three four inch pieces of wood, you could probably cut no problem. Get much bigger than that, I think it'd be useless. Fair enough. Now the last There's one some... I'll pick your brain. On. Oh, sorry, did you have something to say on that? There's probably someone out there who would disagree and say, I've used it to cut much bigger pieces of wood and, I, and, and more power to you. I just, I can't see it as being more efficient at that point than this axe. 
And that's the thing. Like I said, I got zero experience. I'm glad you had a little, so we at least have an opinion on it. Uh, have you ever heard of a Brazilian bush blade? Which still technically is, that, is kind of an axe, but not really an axe. That the one that's got like a, a steel C, and then it's just a thin blade going inside the C? Yes, it is. Used commonly okay. for working around uh, blazing trails. Because they're good for like just taking a swath off a tree to blaze a trail. Uh, but more commonly where I see them is Christmas tree use. Yeah. Uh, I haven't really used them much. I've seen them. I think you have a similar thing. The blade somewhat limits you in what you can do. But I think for what it does, it's probably a great tool. And anyway, like I said, that was just kind of a running opinion on it myself. I don't see it being a true axe. Somebody will disagree nice. with me, I'm sure, but I, I don't see it being a true axe. But I figured I'd throw it out there because it is technically in the axe family. It's it's lightweight, and again, similar to the billhook. Cutting smaller brush, even branches and stuff like that, it, it would work fairly well. But once you reach to the, the ends where the blade attaches, it's pretty much that's going to limit your use right anything bigger than that you're not going to get inside that blade you're going to have your it's not going to work not to mention um, that the 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 blade that runs between the sea uh it's prone to torquing and twisting i have used yeah. one of these with natural resources a few times when we were doing stuff and i mean they do serve a purpose oh yeah they're just they suit that purpose great and anything outside that purpose is just kind of you're working for it honestly you can do other stuff with it not saying you can't but you work yeah. for it and with anything, with any tool, if you use it enough and you get skilled with it, you can find ways to, to use it to its most advantage. You could potentially do more with it than somebody who's not experienced with said tool. Does that make it the perfect tool for everything? No. Everything has its limit. Like we said, a saw can't, or an axe can't compete with a saw where the saw is the proper tool. A, a saw won't always compete with an axe in certain tasks. A hammer is still better than an axe in, to, in making a building, a structure, right? Can you use it? You can get axes that can pull nails. You can get axes that will drive nails. Still not replacing a hammer. Hammer's purpose-built. Axe is purpose-built. You can get, I mean, the, the types of axes out there are, are pretty amazing. People use the roofing axes for bushcrafting because they have... Uh, the ability to pull nails and a few extra tools on them, um, like more of a hammerhead on the end, a little bit of a. If I was building a shelter, that might be the axe I'd take. Gives me a few more options. All right. Well, um, I think we've touched on most of the stuff on axes I wanted to touch on. Uh, yeah, I guess. I think, well. No, no. I'm just looking around, seeing if I had anything else here. Uh, I guess the takeaway for me that I'd like people to be aware of is there's tons of options out there. Find the one that suits you the best. Uh, it doesn't have to be expensive, as Ben said. Like, there's lots of good, cheap, or cost-effective alternatives. Um, so don't just throw money at something just because it costs money. Uh, get out there. Try some things. See what you like. See what makes you happy when it comes to having an axe. Uh, the length you like may be different than us. You may like a shorter axe like this because all you're going to be doing is fine tasks. You might want an axe like this that's kind of my happy medium to do everything around the camp. Maybe you want a longer handled axe because you're just going to, you know, power through everything. It's, it's, there is no wrong answer to what is the best axe to take out because the best axe to take out is the axe you like to do the tasks that you're doing. But, uh, try some. Uh, ask your friends. Like, I mean, I... If anybody wants to try my axe, I'm more than willing to let them try it if we're out in the woods together. That's no sweat off my back. But the key is take care of your gear. Uh, take the time. Sharpen it up. Because, I mean, it's real easy to have a dull axe and complain about it and say your axe doesn't work good. But it comes down to you didn't do the maintenance on it. And if you're not sure on how to sharpen an axe, it's one of those things. Uh, most times I just tell you try it and get at her. But it's really one of the things, much like sharpening a knife, Find somebody that may know a little bit more than you and get shown properly. Because once you get the angle offset on your axe, uh, you can get into glancing issues and stuff like that, which just leads to unsafe habits uh, because you'll be kiltering it, trying to combat it, and you just won't have a good experience out of it. So yeah, uh, try stuff, take care of it, and 
that that's pretty much it for me. Do you find um, what's Hey, Gary Lynch just came in. Hey, Gary. Uh, what about guards that go on your handle just below the head of your axe? Oh, you mean, like, I kind of made my own there, Chris. You mean something like that, like the big rubber or leather thing that you see that goes under there? Um, the idea behind them is just, as you said, it's a guard if you accidentally hit the handle. Um, and for glancing and stuff like that, it may save it a little bit. Honestly, I don't got much of a use for them beyond... My paracord wrap, and that's literally just because it's a little bit of extra paracord with me. What about you, Ben? Do you see a whole lot of... I I have a series of broken splitting axes that may have been saved had I used such a, a structure. I have broken a few handles over the years and, and received quite a bit of damage from overswing. Um, so I, I see a point to them. I, I don't own one. I haven't put one on any of my axes in years. Um, but I do see the point of them. I think they're, they're a great tool and there's some great leather guys they do that'll make you a beautiful set or paracord wrap like you've done is not, not a bad option. In fact, it, it gives you a few options. I've even seen guys store things in the side, like they got a fire steel they store up there and stuff in case of emergency. So there's a lot of stuff you can do that there. Uh, uh but it's each his own, right? You can add these things and... So we're going to get into the dirty talk here now. So uh, <laughs> I use the paracord wrap on this only because I short stroke everything with this axe. I'm never going into a full power stroke, so I'm not coming right up to the head and trying to swing down. It's always about halfway down is all I'm doing short stroking. Uh, so yep. if you're short stroking an axe, I think they're a great thing. If you miss, it's going to offer you some protection. On any axe where I'm going to be taking, like trying to get a good power stroke in, like a splitting axe or something like that, personally i find they get in my way i tend to not have them i do know like on splitting axes you can get a rubber one that's v-shaped and it's meant that if you miss it's going to glance the axe away which to me just adds on a whole other safety issue because now you have a flying axe just sprawling around but to me for anything that i'm trying to put some power behind i do not care for them because they get in the way because when i do go to like power swing an axe i'm straight up to the head and then come down and my arms meet down here. So that's just one more thing. Like I either have to grab below it or allow it to go over it. And that's just a comfort thing to me. I'm, I'm not a big fan of it that way. But like my, my bush axe here, I love it because I never grab above there. So, yeah. I mean, it's it's not only a little protection in there because I'm working around limbs and stuff like that. And you know yourself. It's easy to be like women something up here and miss and you're into your handle or, you know, do all those safe things. But, uh, and it gives me the option to have a little bit of paracord with me. And yeah. I just used a wrap with an inner tuck, and it works great. So, fact, yes. That, oh, sorry, that to me is the, is the best advantage with the paracord one is you have that length of rope in case you need it. Because if you're in the woods cutting stuff, there's always a time you'll need to tie something up or support things. So having that there is a great little advantage. So when it comes to rope, in my opinion, have you ever made natural cordage and tried to do anything with it? Me? Yeah. Occasionally. <laughs> Oftentimes when I'm brushing my dog. So my opinion on natural cordage is, oh yeah, you can do it, but it's incredibly time consuming. Uh, and if you screwed up, you can be a long time working at garbage. So there is a knack to it. I'm not saying it's bad to use natural cordage and stuff like that, but you want to know what's way easier? 30 feet of paracord. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's not natural, and no, I'm not surviving out in just the natural land, but that's not what I'm about either. I'm not about going out there and just using what I find around me. Around me. I believe in making things simple. I enjoy being in the woods and having all the fun, but I'm also going to use some modern conveniences or cheat. And rope is one that I cheat on. Melissa is great at making natural cordage. She's better than I am. And honestly, to get like 30 feet of natural cordage... It takes a while to gather the materials and clean out the materials and then get the materials worked. Or you can just peel off 30 feet of rope and you're done in five minutes. Well, I mean, you want to go real natural. Maybe you should go back to a wood or to a stone head axe. You know what? I am going to try that. I want to make a stone head axe. So we haven't talked about it on this because we were talking about natural axes, but that is another option for an axe. Once you know how to make a stone axe, you have the potential of making an axe out in the bush. Uh, it's something I've never done, but I do want to try it. 
I watched someone do it one time in a river, a, a video, anyways, of a guy doing it. And he found like a, a rock with a little bit of a hollow in it. And he found another rock and he sat there with a bit of sand. He just started working it along that hollow and he he shaped like he didn't chip one, he grinded one by himself on his thing. And it took him hours. Uh, and then he split a log and he stuck it in it and he wrapped the cord around so it wedged it in place. But then when he went out cutting wood, like, you're just beating a piece of a, a, a tree into submission. You're not Pretty cutting much. it. Like, <laughs> he's, he's beating the fibers apart, right? Like, it is a rough way to go. I, I like a little bit of convenience. I, I do. But, uh, no, I mean, all these little things you can add on or do with an axe, they're, they're great. Um, I, I really feel that at bare minimum, though, you definitely want your, your safety, your sheath, your face, whatever you want to call it. You want something not to cover that. that and you don't way. need a fancy sheath either, guys. I mean, that is not the best option there. It's just a piece of inner tube with a nope. piece of, uh, what is that? That is I garden that, hose, isn't it? No, I think that's high pressure fuel line. I had some laying in the Ooh. garage and I cut it to suit. <laughs> so i mean that that works that protects the edge it protects you it protects your gear uh these... i've made oh, kydex yes i was about I to mention Kydex. i made a kydex one or kydex style out of vacuum ho or pvc tubing um mm. and just riveted tips on it and stuff and, and that worked great but i had a fancy lacing system on it it was very complex and i found that i used to mess it oh well but there is options out there ranging from like your axe very cheap to very expensive but don't think just the most expensive is automatically the best it definitely has a brand name behind it if you're paying a lot of money but that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to do anything better than perhaps one you made at home if you put a little effort into it so um anyway yeah that was my ramble on axis what's what's your takeaway from all of this ben um, similar to yours, I mean, find something that works for you that you're comfortable with that, that you can pack in easily. And, uh, that's going to do the jobs you need with all my gear. I think about what I'm going to do, what I tend to do and not what I'm going to end up doing. And I try to take the tools that I think would be best for that particular tasking. So if I was going out for three or four days and I knew I was going to process a fair bit of wood, I might take the bigger ax. If I'm just thinking I may have to do a small amount of work, I would take a smaller, lighter axe just because it's going to fit in my pack and it's not going to be in the way. And I, like this one I can put on my belt. You know, I think about what I'm going to do, and that's why I have a plethora of, of axes, and I have others that I haven't even shown. Uh, take, you know, take the right tool for the job you t at least intend to do. Fair enough. Um, so just to finish this out, we did want to touch a little bit on the Nova Scotia bushcraft gathering that is coming up this weekend. Uh, Atlantic bushcraft adventures is planning to be there myself. I am hoping for Sunday, uh, if plans change, I'll put it up on the page, but what about you, Ben? What are you thinking? My intent right now, as it stands is to be there Saturday, probably mid day to early to late um, either late in the morning or early in the afternoon and stay till Sunday. Um, I'm going to meet some friends there. I've already been talking to them. If you, you go on to the bushcrafting, uh, Nova Scotia bushcraft site, you'll probably see some of the conversations. I'm really looking forward to getting to talk to some, some people who watch our show, some people who don't. That's really good too. Uh, but just people who enjoy doing the same sort of things that we do and, and other people who do very similar things is in the way there's some bushcraft uh, YouTubers coming up there for sure uh, and uh, talk to them. Uh, maybe we'll see Gary Lynch there. I know Jeremy's showing up. A couple of buddies of mine. Um, Lawrence Kamu, you know, is running it. Rob Young will be there, I'm sure. There's a ton of other guys. That we could list the names probably all day, and I'll get half of them wrong. <laughs> but yeah it's gonna be it should be a great time i'm hoping that maybe there will be a, a point where we can't have fires that's my biggest concern right now and uh hope we'll see what the weather brings 
and we may have some surprises for anyone to show up, but maybe with some things to show and talk about. So that oh, might be okay. interesting. So you are going to drop the ball a little bit on that. I was keeping hush lipped about it. I'm just throwing it out there. Maybe something that we have. At least show people. We'll see. Fair enough. Um, I have to leave Saturday afternoon for a wedding. So, Gary, you may see Ben there. Uh, oh, he's leaving Saturday at noon. Gary Wench. <laughs> So you may cross paths, you may not. Uh, we are hoping to do some sort of broadcast from the park, but it's going to depend on internet connections. So it might be a record and upload, or if we do have half decent cell phone reception or internet, we will try and do a quick live broadcast from there too. So anybody that is unable to make it, um, stay tuned for either Saturday or Sunday. Maybe we'll get some video up for you guys to be able to take a look at everything that's going on. And we'll try and at least say hi to a few people. Uh, like I said, ideally I would like to have been there for a little bit more time. It just wasn't in the cards, unfortunately, but, uh, Ben will be there. He'll be elbow nudging and tongue wagging to everybody. I'm sure. And Sunday, whoever's left, if you're listening to this, definitely look for us. As Ben said, there might be some goodies. It's hard to say what's going to happen there. Uh, but we'd at least like to talk to you, get your opinions on the podcast, thoughts, stories. Just say hi. Like, I mean, I'm excited to see everybody. It's always a great adventure. Uh, it's always a good time. Anybody that's been thinking about going, I think they're running it Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Four days? Yeah, I'm not 100% sure on that. Anyway, check out the Nova Scotia Bushcraft Facebook group, which I think will link you to the Nova Scotia Bushcraft Gathering group. Uh, and all the information's there. Lawrence Camo, uh, you can get a hold of him. Jamie Harris, uh, Rob, Mark. There's a few other ones there that'll be able to give you a whole bunch of other information. Uh, just reach out to them. They'll let you know where it's at, how much it costs, all that good stuff. You will not be disappointed if you go. And, hey, you might get to meet us, which is always a great thing, too. Well, at least one of us. Well, yeah. You'll probably get to meet Ben. <laughs> well, I mean, being great, like, there's, there's a better half and a lesser half. Well, I was about to say, half. at least you're going to get to meet the clever half. The good-looking half oh, you may not get to meet. Lesser half, but heck. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, yeah, we're definitely going to be there. We're looking forward to seeing everybody. Uh, so anyway, that's it for me for tonight. Hopefully I get to see some of you on Sunday. Yeah. Yeah, hopefully we get to see you guys out there. Uh, or if you're not there when we're there, get out. Even if you're there the day before and you miss us, it's still a great chance. You get to meet some great people. Uh, and I'm sure anyone who goes will learn something. Okay. Um, what? You'll, that's that's for you to discover. But. Well, that's just it. There's always something going on. And if anybody's wondering what there is for entertainment, the event itself is much entertainment. I think they're still looking to do some trade blankets. Uh, they always yeah. do some campfire stuff. I'm not going to say specific things, but like... Uh, oh, yeah, I am going to say specific things. I know there was... They did some singing, they did some meals, there's some storytelling, um, there's no scheduled demonstrations or stuff like that, but you can almost bet your bottom dollar there's going to be some guys showing some stuff off there. There's a wealth of knowledge coming into this thing. Maybe I got a text from somebody. Nope, not important. Moving on. So anyway, yeah. I, uh, I have promised so that I won't torture anyone there with my singing or musical ability. Oh, I think you should. We're gonna no, we're no, gonna make a theme song. We'll sing it every night. That is a cruel and unusual punishment <laughs> to put anyone through. <laughs> but anyway, that's it for me. Hopefully, I'll see you on Sunday. And uh, if not, look for Ben. Ben will be there Saturday and Sunday. At least come out and say hi. We'd much appreciate it. Yes, yes, for sure. Drop in, say hi. Tell us what you like. Tell us what you don't like. Tell us what you think we should do differently. We can take we it. Continue. We are thick-skinned, and we're always willing to learn. Except for Rob. He can't tell me anything. No. My, my neighbor at my cabin, he's, he's already told me he's got a list. He listened for five minutes. He has a list of things that we need to change. Okay. Awesome. I I told him that I'd love to hear it next week, and I haven't, I'm haven't. i not showing up next week. <laughs> anyway, so guys. What's that? The week after next. Okay. <laughs> what? Okay. 
All right, guys. Everybody have a good night. Night.